Acts chapter 2, and let us begin at the beginning of the chapter, and we'll be reading through verse 41. Acts 2, beginning in verse 1, let us read and hear the word of God together. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were, dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men, from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused, because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, Visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others, mocking, said, they are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, Let this be known to you and heed my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my maid servants and on my or excuse me, on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. Him, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, And having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into into the heavens, but he says himself, 
The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. And let's now go to God in a time of prayer to seek his blessing on our time in his word. Let's pray. Our God, we come to you again this morning, aware of our need of you. Our Father, we pray that you would grant us your spirit to understand your word, and not only to understand it, but to submit to it and to believe it. Father, we confess that we know and believe that we are by nature so corrupt and so sinful, and so against everything that is godly, that apart from the working of your grace in our hearts, apart from the powerful working of your Spirit, we might hear these things and continue in our hardness of heart. We might hear these glorious truths of who your Son is and what he has done, and yet remain indifferent, remain in our rebellion, And so, Father, we pray that you would work in our midst. I pray especially this morning for any who don't know Christ, for any who you have not done that work of your Spirit in their hearts to cause them to see the glory of the crucified and risen Savior who is now the King of glory. I pray, Father, that you'd be merciful and that today would even be a day of salvation in which you would draw many to yourself. We pray this morning for all churches who are preaching the gospel, that you would bless the ministry of your word, and we pray that Christ would be held forth in all of his glory, that he would be exalted and that he would be admired admired among men, and that we would bow our knee and that we would submit to this King of kings and Lord of lords. Help us, our Father, we pray, and draw near to us this morning. In Christ's name, amen. C.S. Lewis was a Christian apologist, and he's famous for giving us three ways that we may receive and view Jesus Christ. Lewis, uh, in his day, was writing in the context of liberalism, and he was surrounded by those who wanted to take the parts of Jesus that they liked from the Bible and just leave off the other parts Uh, Many of his peers wanted to accept that perhaps Jesus was a good moral teacher, but not accept his claims to be God. Many wanted to praise our Lord's message of love and forgiveness, but deny the reality that he raised from the dead. In other words, many in C.S. Lewis's day viewed Jesus just as a mix and match, someone that we can take parts of and reinvent and make ultimately our own Christ. But Lewis saw the inconsistency of his peers and what they were trying to do, and he was very troubled by it. And so he wrote and he said to them, you essentially have three options, and only three. He said, you can either accept Jesus Christ as a liar, or a lunatic, or as Lord. That is, he was saying you can either say that Jesus was lying about who he was, deceiving others, 
Or you can say that he himself was self-deluded, self-deceived, thinking he was something that he was not, or he really was who he claimed to be. Listen to Lewis. He writes this. He says, I'm, I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. Quote, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. Lewis comments. He says, that is the one thing we must not say. Because a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher, he would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be a devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else he is a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to leave that open to us. Now it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend. And consequently, Lewis says, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he is God. That is Lewis's assessment of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's also the Apostle Peter's assessment here in verse 36. But what I want to press upon all of us this morning to quote Lewis is this reality. We all must make our choice. What will we think of Jesus Christ? How will we own him in our heart of hearts? Will we own him as a liar? Someone who deceived? Will we own him as someone who was confused? Or will we humbly bow down and acknowledge him that he is Lord and God? I want to open up briefly this morning Peter's sermon under two very simple and straightforward headings. As he confronts his listeners with the reality of who Jesus Christ is and what Jesus Christ has done. I want to impress all of us and encourage all of us to realize that just as Peter was confronting and demanding a verdict and a response from his listeners 2,000 years ago, so now today, as we open up the Word of God, God is making that same demand of all of us. That we are being presented with a person here and we must have a response towards him. And so we, I want to jump into Peter's sermon at verse 22 we won't be able to consider everything at length and in depth, but I want to just consider the gist of Peter's sermon as he preached Christ and the gospel uh, to his audience this day of Pentecost. And so let us first consider, if you're taking notes, the first of my two headings is simply called the death of Christ. I simply want to lay out for us and open up for us the very important things we must understand about what Jesus Christ came in this world to do and so the first thing that I want us to see is the death of Christ. And uh, just for context, uh, we've read most of the chapters so that we can kind of orient ourselves, but this is the day of Pentecost. It was a feast of the Jews. At this point in redemptive history, Jesus has already come into the world. He has lived. He has died. He has been risen from the dead, and he has ascended into heaven and just as he promised, he has poured forth, poured out the gift of his Holy Spirit upon his church. Uh, this is the great promise that Christ promised his disciples in the beginning of Acts, in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, when he commands, before he ascends, he says to his disciples, remain in Jerusalem. Do not go outside Jerusalem until you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and he will give you power. And this power that the Spirit gives the church is a very particular kind of power. It is the power, according to Acts 1, to be Christ's witnesses. And that is precisely what we see throughout the whole book of Acts, the Spirit doing. The Spirit giving his church unction to proclaim and defend Christ. And Acts 2, verse 4, you can glance up at, at it if you want. Uh, this takes place. The Spirit descends and fills his church, and they begin to speak. 
And in particular, they begin to speak in all sorts of different languages, which if you study the New Testament, that is what the gift of tongues is all about. It is about the Spirit giving his people the ability to speak the gospel in languages they've never learned, such that all of their audience who was present, even though they weren't natives of Jerusalem, even though they spoke different languages from those who were from Galilee, they were able, verse 6, to understand everything that the, the disciples were proclaiming to them. I think sometimes we can become so used to these passages of Scripture that we don't stop to think about how amazing that would have been to witness. <laughs> Just a, a handful of disciples all of a sudden standing up and being, unctioned by giving, being given unction by the Spirit of God to speak of Christ in all sorts of languages that they've never heard, they've never given themselves to learn, and their audience is hearing for the first time about the gospel of Christ about what has just taken place in these last weeks here in Jerusalem, the center of God's redemptive purposes. And some respond, as we would expect, in verse 12, with amazement and wonder. And they say, and I think they're sincere when they say this, in verse 12, whatever could this mean? They want to know and understand more of what is going on here. What are we witnessing here? Uh, but then in verse 13, there's a different response. It says, others mocked, saying they're full of new wine. And even here, don't we, uh, we see two different, very different responses that you can have to the gospel of Christ. You can, with interest and intrigue, want to know what exactly is going on here. Or you can mock, and you can chalk it up simply to a bunch of men who have been drinking too early in the morning. But the disciples know better. And uh, uh, Peter especially, and in particular, who Peter, remember, was in many ways the leader of the apostolic band, he recognizes that the reputation of our Lord, the reputation of the gospel, uh, is coming into question, and it is being brought into reproach here, and he understands that a defense is necessary. An apologetic needs to be given. And so he stands up in verse 14, and he raises his voice. And he does exactly what the Spirit was given him to do. He begins to proclaim Christ. He begins to proclaim the gospel. He tells his audience that what they are witnessing here on this historic day in God's redemptive purpose is not the result of drunkenness. It's, it, he says it's only nine in the morning. Uh, he says, but this is indeed the fulfillment of the prophet, what the prophet Joel said. So many centuries before, this is what God promised would happen in the last days when the Messiah would pour forth the Spirit of God upon all flesh. And Peter takes the opportunity, and I think we have an example here of good evangelism. He notices that his audience is taken in and captured by something that's going on, and he says, you know what, let me take this opportunity to tell you about the source of what's going on, and he turns their attention to Christ, to his death and his resurrection. And so let's jump in at verse 22 as we look at and consider just briefly uh, Peter's sermon here. Look at verse 22 with me. He says, uh, he begins by saying, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth. Now, let us just pause there. Jesus of Nazareth, that title had very significant meaning. meaning. Uh, both to Peter's audience, it would have had very significant uh, meaning, as well as to Peter himself. Uh, Jesus of Nazareth was the title in John 19.19 19 that Pilate had inscribed upon uh, as Jesus was hanging in shame upon the cross of Calvary, and it said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Jesus of Nazareth was a name that the Jews hoped would live on in infamy. It was a name that they hoped would become synonymous with imposter, uh, a name that would have been synonymous with shame, uh, synonymous with falsehood, a man who claimed to be something he was not. But not only would that name have rung in the ears of Peter's audience, it would have rung, I think, very sharply in Peter's own ears as he uh, proclaims Jesus' name, because that is the exact title that just weeks before this event, that is the exact name that Peter denied knowing three times. As uh, a little servant girl over and over asked Peter the Apostle, 
who is so confident that even if it means I must die with you, Lord, I will follow. Yet a little servant girl asks him three times, weren't you also with Jesus of Nazareth? And Peter, in shame and in fear, cowers. And he denies Jesus of Nazareth. But what a contrast we see here, right, in Acts chapter 2, that Peter now is standing as a primary leader of the church. He stands up and boldly, not frightened this time, not ashamed, but with boldness, proudly owns the name Jesus of Nazareth. And he wants his hearers to know that he's not the only one who owns this name. Look at verse 22. He wants these uh, men of Israel to know that this Jesus of Nazareth is a man who is approved of God or attested by God as the New King James has it. And you know, brothers and sisters, how little difference it makes how many men might own or not own a name in comparison to whether the God of the universe owns a name. How did God show his pleasure in his son and his approval of Jesus? Peter tells us in verse 22, he says he was attested by miracles, wonders, and signs that God did through him in your midst. I mean, we, we've begun the gospel of Mark together here as a congregation, and Mark, I think out of all the gospels, you read it, and it is as fast-paced as you can get in terms of one miracle after another. One amazing wonder, one amazing sign right on the back of the one that's following. Uh, and that's what Peter is really saying here, that Jesus, as you saw him in your midst, you saw him raise people from the dead. Uh, you, you heard his teaching. You saw him restore sight to the blind. You saw him calm the winds, calm the seas. And you know, I think contrary to a lot of misunderstanding in our day, where we have a lot of people who are wanting to experience the miraculous simply for the sake of experience, Peter here explains to us the biblical purpose of signs and wonders. Signs and wonders have always been given by God in key parts of redemptive history for this purpose, to attest to the message and to attest to the messenger and to show from heaven, this is my man. This truly is my word coming from the mouth of God. Uh, signs are God's heavenly stamp of approval, his seal upon Jesus' ministry. And Peter wants his listeners to realize that this happened. And look at his, uh, the emphatic words he says there. He says, as you yourselves know. And it's literally emphatic in the Greek. It's not just as you know, it's as you yourselves know. And what Peter is doing here is he's bringing home the application very pointedly to his hearers. That these signs and wonders that were done through Jesus Christ was, were not something that was done in a corner somewhere. It's not something that was done in a closet away from the rest of the world. But he's appealing to his audience's consciences. You yourselves saw his ministry. You saw him with your very own eyes. You heard him teach day after day uh, in the temple. I mean, even Nicodemus, John 3, uh, comes to our Lord by night, and Nicodemus was a leader of the Jews, and he says, Teacher, we know that no man can do these things unless God is with him. And Peter is driving home. Uh, what He wants them to realize that because they know because they have been shown all of these things, they stand culpable for how they respond. They stand responsible for how they respond. And you know, brothers and sisters, friend, if you're here and you're not a Christian, that's very important for us to understand. All of God's revelation to us, and revelation is just a big word that means all that God reveals to us. All of God's revelation to us demands a response. It's not something that we can ever choose to just ignore or remain neutral to. These men and women in Peter's audience saw with their very own eyes the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see as we read in the scripture the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is just as authoritative. What we read in the scripture is God telling us on the authority of himself, who cannot lie, this is my son, this is what he has done, how will you respond? 
And I want to encourage all of us this morning, it's essential that we understand this, that these are not just fables of men. Uh, the things that we're reading here don't stand on the authority of any pope, any church, anyone. These things come to us on the authority of God himself, truth itself who cannot lie, and we are accountable for how we respond. How did they respond to Christ in their midst? Well, they responded, the Jews, just as we all would have responded, apart from the grace of God. Look at verse 23. You have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. You know, I think Peter is making somewhat of a jab at his audience here, the Jews prided themselves on their law keeping. They were the ones who, pro, who, who, who confessed to love the law of God, who confessed to keep the law of God in its entirety. But Peter wants them to know and be confronted with the reality that there was nothing lawful about the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. I encourage you, brothers and sisters, read through the Gospels regularly, especially the accounts of, of his, uh, his arrest and his trial, his death and his burial and resurrection, uh, because you will see things all throughout his trial. They couldn't even get a charge to stick to our Lord Jesus Christ. They couldn't even get two witnesses to agree. Uh, even Pilate himself said, I find no guilt in him. And yet, they responded by murdering the Son of God. They responded by murdering Christ. They, they murdered the only one who actually kept the law. The only one who actually didn't deserve death. They hung upon a Roman cross in shame. Why did they do that? Why was that their response? Peter, in our present account, doesn't give us all the details of it. But I want to go to just one text. And I, you read your Bible, and this is made clear all across the Old Testament and the New Testament. Let me point us to one text as to why Jesus was crucified. Turn to John chapter 3. And, you know, if I'm ever in a conversation with someone and they're asking me just basic questions, what's the problem with man? What's the problem with our world? John 3 is almost hands down a text I always draw people's attention to. Uh, because these verses give us a diagnosis of the condition of the human heart. And these verses get right at the heart of why human beings, sinful human beings, respond the way they do to Jesus Christ. Uh, John 3, let's look at verse 19. This is right after the famous John 3, 16. Uh, and I really think we would understand verse 16 better if we kept it in its whole paragraph and context here. Look at what John the Apostle writes in John 3, beginning in verse 19. And this is just speaking in general of all men, all humans. He says, and this is the condemnation, or this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world. Now that's a reference to Christ himself, Jesus himself, uh, God, the second person of the Trinity, coming into the world, and he is perfect. He is light. He's pure. He's holy. Uh, and John goes on, he says, and men loved darkness rather than the light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. Mark this. This is very important for us to understand. Brothers and sisters, friend, this is a love-hate issue that is going on here that John is describing. John is describing a moral issue of our heart. There is something wrong with our hearts. He says that we hate the light and we love the darkness because we are darkness. We are sinful and so we hate holiness. That's why we don't love Jesus. Uh, Jesus is opposed to everything that is dark and he exposes the darkness. And that's why we don't love him. Look at verse 20. That's exactly what John says. For everyone who practices evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God or wrought by God. You see that? That is why they crucified the Lord of glory. That is why they, they crucified the perfect, sinless Son of God. It wasn't because he didn't do a good enough job explaining who he was. I think that's what many people think. And that's, in fact, what the Jews wanted him to think. 
That's why they continued to ask him, give us a sign. If you just give us more signs, we'll believe. The issue was not that they needed more signs. The issue is that they didn't like the signs that they had been given. They didn't like the one who had come into their midst and into their presence. It's very important for us to understand lack of information is not the problem of our unbelief in Jesus Christ. They knew, just as Peter says, you saw, your minds computed, this is the Son of God. There is no other logical explanation. This is who he is. Brothers and sisters, our problem is that we hate the light by nature because we love darkness, because our deeds are evil. And we know that if I admit that he is the Son of God, that means I have to give up my sin, and I don't want to do that, right? Our problem is that we have a moral aversion to all that is good, and that's what it means to be a sinner. That's what it means to be sinful. We have deliberately turned away from our Creator. We have rejected him because we didn't want him, And we have turned inward to love ourselves, to serve ourselves, to set ourselves up as our God and our King. And any light that seeks to break in, any light that seeks to shine on that and expose that reality, we hate. And so what is our response apart from the grace of God? We need to extinguish the light. We need to get it out of here. Just let us go on and live in our darkness. Brothers and sisters, that is man's, every man's, every woman's, every child's response to God apart from his grace, apart from his spirit changing our hearts. That is why they murdered Jesus Christ. That is why they hung him on a cross. It wasn't because he hadn't shown himself to be who he was. It was because they didn't like who he was. But you know what? They didn't win. John's gospel opens up with the words that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. These men's lawless act, as they tried to extinguish the light of the world, were unbeknownst to them actually carrying out the eternal plan of God to save his people. That's exactly what Peter says. What a a sermon on God's sovereignty. He doesn't explain it all. He just asserts it. This is what's going on here. Look at verse 23. Peter says, this Jesus, being delivered by who? Not by men. Being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. Brothers and sisters, the cross, Calvary, the crucifixion, everything that took place at Golgotha 2,000 years ago is first of all God's act, not first of all man's act. The, 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 the crucifixion was not the failure of God's purposes. It was the fulfillment and the bringing to pass of all of God's purposes. God the Father delivered the Son to death. He didn't just permit it. He didn't just allow it, but he purposed it. He delivered him. And Christian, let me encourage all of us, we don't need to blush at that in the slightest. We don't need to be ashamed in saying that as though that's controversial or or, or as though that's even offensive. Some have even had the audacity to call this divine child abuse. And they reject just out of hand anyone who could possibly believe God the Father would actually deliver his precious son to bear the sins of his people. Brothers and sisters, we don't have to be ashamed of this. In fact, we need to own this proudly and with joy and with adoration because this is the very foundation of the gospel. Without this, not to overstate it, just like without the resurrection, you don't have a gospel. Without the Father delivering the Son, you don't have a gospel. Because without divine intention, if there is no divine intention in the cross, then the crucifixion of Jesus was nothing more than a mere historical great miscarriage of justice and nothing more. If God has nothing to do with it, God cannot be saving his people through the events that transpired at Calvary. Stick close to Romans 8, verse 32, which says, he, talking about the Father, he who did not spare his son, but delivered him for us all, how shall he not with him also give us all things? Brothers and sisters, this is the glory of the gospel. 
This is what we celebrate on Resurrection Sunday, that when Christ died, though he was put there by the evil hands of lawless men, it was not without purpose. And it was fulfilling the eternal purpose of God, that God the Father was putting Christ forward as a substitute for his people, to bear in his body their sins, to redeem them from the curse of sin by Christ becoming a curse for them. That is what this is all about. And Peter wants his audience to know, you didn't win. You think you win. You think you extinguished the light. You actually did the very thing God has intended from the very beginning of all of his decrees to exalt his son. And he's going to raise him from the dead, and he's going to ascend, and he's going to sit down at his throne, and he's going to be the king of kings, the Lord of glory forevermore. That's what Peter is declaring here. Now the question for us, brothers and sisters, is how do we know that Christ's death was a success? How do we know that it was a success? And that is what Resurrection Sunday is all about. We know it was a success because God has highly exalted him, both in his resurrection from the dead and his ascension and exaltation into heaven. And that's the second thing I want us to see this morning is Christ's exaltation, his exaltation, You know, it's good for us, and I already encouraged us in this, it's good for us, brothers and sisters, to be reading through the Gospels and the life of our Lord Jesus often, uh, especially the events of his uh, trial and his death and his resurrection, because each Gospel presents the events surrounding the end of Christ's life in a different light. I was reading Matthew uh, this week, just as we were going through uh, the week approaching Good Friday and and, uh, Easter Sunday, And I was reading especially Matthew 27 and 28, and two things struck me as I read through the gospel of Matthew. One is how clear and convincing the evidence for Jesus' resurrection was. Just undeniable. People witnessed it. People saw it. It was a fact. But the second thing that struck me was how apart from the Spirit working in men's hearts, they will continue to harden their hearts against even the clearest of evidence. Uh, I was reading the chief priests. You can read this later on your own. The chief priests in the end of Matthew's gospel, uh, immediately following Christ's death, they go to Pilate and they say, quote, this deceiver, that's what they call him, this deceiver said while he was still alive that he would rise from the dead after three days. Therefore, Pilate, command that the tomb be made secure so that his disciples don't come in the middle of the night and take him and say that he's been risen from the dead. And so how does Pilate respond? He says, okay, do it. You have guards. Go ahead. Make it as secure as you possibly can. And isn't that just uh, an illustration in itself of the arrogance of man? (laughs) We're going to seal God in a tomb. We're going to put a couple guards on it, and we're going to make sure that this Jesus does not come out of the tomb, Uh, as though they had the ability to do that. Um, and so Pilate tells them to do it, and then the first day of the week, Sunday, comes around, and what happens? As the two guards are there, the angel of the Lord descends, and a massive earthquake takes place. The stone is rolled away from the grave, and the guards, it says, they shook with fear and became like dead men. (laughs) Isn't that how men in the Old Testament always responded when they saw God? (laughs) They became as dead men, and they thought that they were going to die, and rightly so, right? Christ is risen. Christ has risen from the dead, and they are seeing this take place before their very eyes. That is an appropriate response to become fearful and to become as dead men. But the amazing thing is what happens next. They go and they tell the chief priest what had just happened that the stone was rolled away miraculously. Christ has been risen. He's alive. And you know how the chief priests respond? Not in fear, not in repentance. They respond by telling the guards, here, take our money and go and tell everyone that his disciples came at night and stole his body away. And if Pilate hears about this, don't worry. We'll appease him and you won't be bothered. That's how the chief priests responded. Even when their own guards come back and tell them, he's risen. 
There is no other, there is no human explanation for what we just saw. He is alive. This man who died three days ago and was buried and was really dead, he just walked out of the tomb. And still, the chief priest's response is, we won't have it. But Peter wants them to know again in his sermon here in Acts 2 what they already had seen, what they already know, uh, knew. And he declares in verse 24, if you're not in Acts 2, you can go back there. Acts 2, verse 24, he says, whom God raised up. Four little words, but with infinite implications. Whom God raised up. Brothers and sisters, I want to encourage us Let the glory of the resurrection hit you afresh this morning. Those are wonderful words, whom God raised up. Not not just to say on Easter, on Resurrection Sunday once a year. Those are wonderful words all year round. Because those four words explain why the church even exists right now. Because Jesus is not dead, but he is risen. Because he has been successful in what he came to earth to accomplish. And God has proved that by raising him from the dead. Uh, there was a hymn. I wanted to sing it. We used to sing it at Emmanuel. Um, and it was, it's just a hard song to sing. And there's two different parts that are just very difficult. And I thought that probably without a piano player, it's too risky to go for. And we might get lost in it. Um, but go home and just and s- go read over the lyrics of this hymn. Uh, but... The chorus says, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. And then the refrain is, he arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Brothers and sisters, I don't think that we say hallelujah, Christ arose often enough, and that we feel that reality in our heart. And that we can come to view these things as common and ordinary. Jesus has risen from the dead. And that is the only basis of all of our hope. That is the foundation upon which we stand. That that is what the truthfulness of Christianity hinges upon. Is the literal bodily resurrection of Christ from the grave. Uh, Because if he is dead, then he is a fraud. If he's dead, he is like every other man who claimed to be something, but clearly wasn't it. But if he is alive, he is Lord. If he's alive, he is king. That's why Paul goes through, uh, as much as he does in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, Rich read it almost in its entirety. That's why Paul goes through the pains that he goes through to say, if Jesus is still dead, then our faith is futile. Uh, we're still dead in our sins. Our preaching is pointless, and we are of all people most to be pitied. But if he's been raised from the dead, then that means that everything he said about himself is true, that he was who he said he was, and he did what he said he came to do. That's why Paul opens up the uh, book to the Romans, chapter 1, verse 4, saying that Christ was declared to be the Son of God with power through the resurrection of the dead. All the other signs that God did through him were evidence enough to show that he was who he was. But the resurrection is the pinnacle. It is the greatest sign. This is my beloved son. Look at verse 24. Uh, Peter says that Christ has uh, loosed the pains of death. He's loosed the pains of death in verse 24. And that word loosed literally has to do with the idea of breaking free from cords. Uh, breaking free from something that was binding us. And Peter is drawing the picture here that Christ was imprisoned, as it were, and bound for our debt. Uh, That is why Christ died. Peter is uh, telling us that the justice of God for sin demanded that someone be thrown in prison. Someone has to die. Someone has to bear the penalty. And all of us this morning, brothers and sisters, know that it should have been us. That's what we deserve. It should have been us hanging on the cross. It should have been us dying, suffering the wrath of God. But Peter wants us to know that that Jesus has borne it for us. And because there is nothing that that God's demands can hold upon Christ and demand of Christ that he has not paid, look at what uh, Peter says here. He says that it was impossible for Christ to be kept. 
I think what Peter's saying there is that Peter went into the, or that, excuse me, not Peter, Jesus went into the tomb to be bound, the penalty that we deserve, but because he has borne it, because his work is satisfactory, death has no claim on him. The grave, it wasn't possible for the grave to hold him, and it had to open up to let Jesus go free because all of its demands had been satisfied. I think it was a Puritan who said that Christ was like a poison to death, and death swallowed him, thinking that it had gained the victory, but Christ, as it laid in death's belly, was a poison that made him sick, and he had to give back his prey. That's what's going on here. Christ is conquering death for his people. Uh, Peter goes on in verse 24, or verse 25, excuse me, uh, look what he says. He, he goes on, not only is this something that they saw with their own eyes, but Peter wants to show them that this is something that the scriptures foretold would happen. And he quotes from Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. Uh, psalm 16 is a psalm of David. David was God's king. Uh, read what Peter quotes. He quotes it in, in the entirety. Uh, psalm 16, 8 through 11, beginning in verse 25 here. Uh, he quotes, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, uh, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart rejoiced, my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh will also rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. And look at verse 27. Because verse 27 is especially what Peter focuses in here in his sermon. He focuses in on, for you will not leave my soul in Hades. And there's a lot of debate you can read about Hades if you really want to study something. Uh, but simply put, Hades just means the grave. Uh, it just means that the grave. It almost always translates the Old Testament word Sheol. And he says, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Now, how does Peter quoting this psalm prove his case? How does it help his argument that Christ really has raised from the dead? Well, look at how he applies it. Look at verse 29. He says, men and brethren. And you know, just a side note, I think we could preach a sermon on this. We see here how polite Peter is to his audience. Even though he's pressing upon them very significant things, he always treats them with respect. And he calls them and addresses them, men and brethren. He says, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David. And I think that's Peter's way of saying, let me just be frank here. Right? David would have been highly esteemed, and rightly so, as a father of the faith. And Peter just says, let me speak plainly to you of David. And he says, David, the man who we all agree penned Psalm 16, uh, who said that his soul would not be abandoned to Hades and his flesh would not undergo corruption, he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is present with us this very day. And when Peter was preaching this sermon in Jerusalem, there was still a monument that Peter could have taken his audience over in Jerusalem and pointed, that's the remains of David, the man who penned Psalm 16. And that, that's what he's saying. His brothers, let's just be honest here. David's dead. David's in a tomb. He did see corruption. Okay, and what his point is, is that when David penned this, clearly he wasn't speaking of himself, was he? And so there's only one conclusion. Verse 30, he was a prophet, speaking of another who was to come. David was speaking of his greater son who was going to come into the world. And remember, brothers and sisters, Scripture has two authors. Whenever we're reading the Bible, it's important that we remember that. Scripture is both human and it is divine. And the human writers, when they wrote, they really wrote what they wanted to write. They wrote what they were experiencing. That's why we can see different styles when we read Peter and Paul and, and David. But underneath that, there is a divine author, God himself, God the Holy Spirit. And ultimately, God is the one who is superintending the writing of Scripture. Uh, he's guiding it. He's guiding the human authors. And oftentimes, he would cause his human writers to write things that even they didn't understand the full implications of. And you can read more about th that if you're interested, 1 Peter 1, 12. But David here, according to Peter, 
when he wrote this psalm, he was conscious of God's promise to him that God made in 2 Samuel 7. Uh, And he seems to have understood, at least to some degree, that as he penned these words, he wasn't speaking of himself, but he was speaking of the Christ. He was speaking of his greater son who would come, as verse 31 says. Uh, God promised David in, in 2 Samuel 7 that he would set a king upon David's throne forever, and his kingdom would be forever, and it would know no end. Except there's only one problem with that when your kings keep dying. David died. Solomon died. All of the other kings of Israel died. And so how was God going to keep his promise to set someone on David's throne forever? He was going to keep it in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, who did die, who tasted death for his people, but who rose from the dead and lives forevermore and will never die again. You know, I want us to notice something here also, brothers and sisters, that's very important. And perhaps this is something we don't focus on as much, uh, just in general, and especially on, on Resurrection Sunday. But it's important for us to understand that there are essentially two parts to Jesus' exaltation. There is first his resurrection from the grave, which is glorious, it's magnificent, and we should stand in awe of it. But the resurrection is not the end of his victory, it's the beginning of his victory. And the second part is that not only does he raise from the dead, but he then ascends into heaven and takes his seat as king of kings at the right hand of God. You know, that's the last uh, line of that hymn that we sung this morning actually captures that beautifully. Uh, The very last line describes Christ. It says, dying in weakness, but rising to what? Reign. Dying in weakness, but rising to reign. Rising from the dead and reigning go together in Jesus' ministry. Because he has died, because he has risen as the victor, he is therefore king. And it would be strange if he arose the victor from from the grave and did not ascend the throne to reign as God's forever king over his people. Brothers and sisters, this Jesus, whom we are confronted with in this sermon of Peter's, He is the one who has been given all authority in heaven and earth. He's not just uh, the suffering servant. He's also the risen and reigning Lord of glory. And he is king of kings. And every human being will either bow the knee to him willingly or they will be crushed by his power in the day of his might, in the day of his wrath when he returns to save his people and to judge his enemies. I hope we see why it's so, under, or so important that we respond rightly to this Jesus of Na- Nazareth. Uh, Peter wants to show us here the glory of Christ. Uh, he shows us here, he even goes on to show that not only is the resurrection of Christ foretold in the Old Testament, but also his ascension and his kingly reign. If you look at verse 34, uh, he says, For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. See, uh, Peter again is doing the same exact kind of logic, isn't he? Uh, Just as he did with the resurrection, so now also with Christ's reign as king. David never ascended into heaven. Uh, The writer of Psalm 110 died. Uh, David never sat down at the Father's right hand. And what his point is, is that David again was writing of another. He was speaking of a greater one, one that even David himself calls Lord. I don't know if you've ever thought about that as you've read Psalm 110, uh, but it's almost as if when you read Psalm 110, David is just kind of a fly on the wall, listening in on a conversation that he's not even a part of. Uh, Psalm 110 opens up, the Lord, Yahweh, is saying not to David, but to David's Lord. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. You know, that stumped the Jews. Jesus actually stumped the Jews with that very question in Matthew 22. They couldn't understand how could the Christ be both the son of David and David's Lord. They had no category for how that could be. And the only way it could be is if the Christ was both the son of David and 
that is, according to the flesh descended from David, which he was, his earthly mother, Mary, and if he was divine. God become human. God in the flesh. That is why he is both David's son and David's Lord. And that is what Psalm 110 is describing is Yahweh the Father saying to David's Lord, the Son, sit at my right hand and you will reign forever and I will make your enemies a footstool. Brothers and sisters, friend, Jesus is no common king. He's not just an earthly man. Uh, He is a man, but he is also divine. And he is the one, that is why he can make claims like he does in John's gospel. He says, I have authority both to lay my life down and I have authority to take it up. No one can say that but God. And that is why it is so important, brothers and sisters, that we respond rightly to this Jesus, that this is the Jesus with whom we have to do. Uh, And brothers and sisters, going back to uh, where we started with Lewis's three ways that we can respond, and friend, especially if you're not a Christian, this is vital for you to consider this Resurrection Sunday. We have three options with what we can do with Jesus of Nazareth. We can call him a liar. We can say that he made up who he was and what he did. We can say that he was a lunatic, that he was self-deceived, or we can bow down and submit to him as our Lord and our God. But I want to encourage all of us, our response to Jesus, how we respond to him does not change in the slightest what reality is. Look at verse 36. Look at how Peter closes his sermon. He declares, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. That is my job as a preacher of the gospel. It's not to stand up here and tell you stories. It's not my job to stand up here and say that it's probable that this is the truth. But it's my job to say, no, assuredly, God has made this Jesus of Nazareth both Lord and Christ. That is reality. That is truth. And the question is not whether it's true. The question is, how are you going to respond? And God in his mercy gives you opportunity right now to respond rightly, to be saved from your sins, to know what it is to be forgiven for your sins, by trusting this reigning and conquering king. Verse 37 tells us how some in Peter's audience responded that day. Look at verse 37. It says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? My friend, it's my prayer this morning that that would be the response of your heart. That you would cry out in your heart, What must I do? You know, I pray, and this is something we should pray for everyone, that you would be cut to the heart. Because you know what? It takes the Holy Spirit to be cut to the heart about our sins. And that is actually the grace of God to cut us to the heart, to feel our sins, to feel our guilt. Uh, Without the Spirit, we will just continue, just like the Jews continued in their hardness of heart against all the evidence in the world. If the Spirit doesn't actually work in our heart, we can hear all the preaching we want. We can have Jesus set before us in all of his beauty, all of his glory, and we will continue just to remain indifferent. And we will continue just to reject him. And so it's my prayer that you would respond by being cut to the heart and that you would cry out, what must I do? And the Bible makes very clear what you must do. Look to the remedy that God has provided in his Son the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ stands ready right now to receive guilty sinners like you and like me. The gospel is not for elite people. It's not for a certain category of people. It is for everyone in the category of sinner. And that is every single person on the face of this planet. Jesus Christ is for you. And he stands ready promising if you'll come to him in faith, if you come to him owning the guilt of your sin owning the reality that you don't deserve redemption. You don't deserve to be a servant who will reign with this king. He says he will receive you, and you will know what it is to be forgiven of your sins, to have peace with God. So my prayer is that this Sunday you would consider 
Christ and that you would respond to him appropriately, not rejecting him as a lunatic, not rejecting him as a liar, but embracing him as Lord and Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your Son, whom you have sent into this world to redeem worthless sinners like us. And we come confessing, Father, that we do come to you with empty hands. Lord, deliver any of us from thinking that we can come to you with anything in our hands that we might offer to you as a reason that we should be accepted. But let us, Father, by faith and humility, own our wretchedness, own our spiritual bankruptcy, and own the fact that we cannot save ourselves and that Christ has done everything that is necessary to bring us to God. Father, I pray for any here today who don't know Christ, that even through the, uh, in many ways, the feebleness of my preaching, that they would come to glorify your Son by relying upon his work, by relying upon who he is for sinners, and that they would cast themselves upon him and be saved from sin. Father, we pray that you would help us. We pray that even as we go out today and no doubt spend time with family, we pray that we would be witnesses and ambassadors of this Savior who is dead and now is risen and ascended to your right hand. Help us to be faithful, we pray, and we ask in Christ's name, amen.